All right, welcome back. Uh, it's been a, a long day. Uh, if you guys are just hanging in there with us. Uh, <laughs> um, so today we're just going to take a chance to, to go into a little bit of discussion with the panel here. We're going to get some questions from you guys as well. And we're just going to see how these, uh, how these ideas we talked about today are involved with each other and what we can learn from it. Um, does anybody want to just kind of start with a, a, a statement, um, pick it off with um, maybe a topic that you think that we should, we should look at that's maybe more important than these other ones? If, if you don't have one, one I, I think is, uh, is good that we don't spend enough time on here is, is, is the nutrition thing. Um, maintaining. Uh, obviously, you're, you're very specific today about specific things. Um, do you guys have any thoughts more about like, general nutrition and how that would be involved with brain health or mental health? Is brain health mental health? <laughs> well, um, I mean, in terms of, uh, when I think of brain health, I think about the physiological organic stuff. And then the mental health aspect of it would be how much stress it causes you to follow a healthy diet. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm semi-vegetarian. And, and I'm semi-vegetarian in the aspect that 90% of my diet is vegetarian. I follow the rules that I have created. And I follow that as closely as I can. But I save 10% of the space for you know, eating out with friends or eating some pizza or whatnot. Because if I didn't have that extra 10% where I could have a cheat day, I would go crazy you know, eating what I eat every day. <laughs> and I live forever, but I feel like it. I feel like it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it just caused me unnecessary stress. Right? And so, a life lesson is like, you don't have control over everything. If you, like I'm working with addicts right now, and addicts relapse, you have to, they have to relapse under the framework that they can not become addicts again. Right? They can go back to being clean. If they relapse and they go, Oh, I ruined my life. It's over, and I feel a bunch of guilt. They'll never come back. Right? So that's a mental aspect of the diet. Well, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the analogy with addicts because it seems to be coming so much more in vogue these days to talk about like sugar as an addiction, right. um, or even salt, mm -hmm. and salt in your food as an addiction. And yeah, I guess like if, if caregivers kind of treat it that way when they're approaching people making positive changes in their life and recognizing just how hard some of those changes might be, even if it seems really obvious. And sort of like, yeah, you shouldn't do so much smack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for somebody who does it every day. Yeah. So the sugar is kind of the same. Question? Um, well, what's your exact diet? <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just to like simplify everything. Well, not exact, but like just general. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you need yeah. that. I'm sure you need that question, but I'm just. We um, keep asking them. Find the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't actually be broccoli raw. It needs to be steamed in order to be digestible and as healthy as possible. 
That would be way roughly wrong. <laughs> like, if, yeah. if, if it upsets your stomach, don't eat it. And the other thing you could eat instead is, like all cruciferous vegetables have this anti-cancer compound. Mm -hmm. So if broccoli is too much for you, you could try cauliflower. It still has it, but just eating yeah. lesser amounts. How about uh, like the other brassica plants, like yeah. uh, kale? And yep, and kale, bok choy. bok choy definitely has it. Yeah. And is it the same situation that uh, with cooking, like you'd have to eat bok choy and kale? Yeah, raw? have to eat it raw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and tell them how much you eat. <laughs> you know, I, was, I, was, I was just about to ask, so, so like the super simplification, so one day, diet in your life. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Take notes every time. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll just, I'll just remember this. Like, Shit, like checks. <laughs> It might sound gross to you all, but um, in the morning, at approximately 200 grams of broccoli that I blend up with some milk and some pomegranate juice, and then I just throw in some Cheerios or something into there with some um, blueberries. And that's my breakfast. Go for it. Doesn't it? It probably tastes pretty good. Taste I've, I've, yeah, okay. I've, done taste weird, I've done weird shapes like it that. Just sound, it just sounds weird, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. That way, in the morning, you get, you know, your anti-cancer thing. You're free for the rest of the day to do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing but burn. So. <laughs> 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 I've got a question. Just, just one more pedantic point about broccoli. Is the enzyme located in the flour or the stem? Uh, it's, a lot of it is located in the flour, but it's right. also found in the stem. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I had a, another question. I think this question was sort of directed at Dana earlier, but I wanted to see if Hans or if you Dana had more chance to think about it, which is that are there are there uh, populations which have particularly good brain health or mental health that we could look to and, and learn something from? Especially the mental health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be different than just cognitive decline. Yeah. So the two populations I know of is one to seven day Adventists, and they're a religious community basically. So. In terms of their mental health, they base a lot upon their beliefs. Right? And the other population is a nun study that I've seen. So these nuns, they're also religious. And they've done <coughs> your pathological studies, so the autopsy I talked about earlier. So a lot of these nuns have tons and tons of amyloid plaques. Like their brains are full. But if you talked to people who knew them before, they were totally fine cognitive. Right? So and if you look at the ha daily habits, they do crosswords, they're very social, right? they're physically active, and they eat well. And among them all, they also have a strong belief and support from their believing you know, their gods. Right? And whether religion does play a role in the whole aspect of um, social support and its relationship to longevity, I don't know, but it seems like it plays a role. By some effect on stress. Yeah, yeah. And also, like they drive to live. Yeah. I think another thing with religious communities, like nuns, would be a particular example. The extreme example is that they leave like very regular lives. Right. Like they're like every day they follow the right. same schedule. They wake yeah. up and sleep at the same schedule. They yeah. sleep at the same yeah. amount of times. They take their meals at the same time. Like everything in their life is sort of quite quite. Regulated in that yeah. way. But you'd think that possibly some of that regimentation might deprive them of the level, well, or, or not, but uh, superficially you'd think that that life wouldn't leave a lot of room for the kind of continuous learning and, uh, you know, expanding yeah. your mental. Yes, but I'm sure they're also involved in some kind of like most of them have jobs. I mean, they, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think they work with people. Yeah, yeah, are we yeah, not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Are they? Are they also like you know praying and, and kind of in some way meditating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there is a Christian meditation tradition too that people don't know about. Yeah. But there's yeah. like monks engaged in that as well. Yeah. Getting to the meditation, and, um, one thing I was surprised to maybe not hear even more about today. Um, you guys are familiar with the quantified self movement. Uh, there's people that are doing things and trying to change things about their own biology. Um, and we have a leader of that here. <laughs> Very nice here. Um, what about uh, this transcranial stimulation thing? It's becoming really a big thing. It's the Kickstarter for the home kit for this. Uh, I, yeah, I, can speak, I can speak to that a bit. So yeah, that's if you guys don't know transcranial stimulation, which is getting popularity, is simply applying electrodes to the scalp and then passing a really weak current through the brain. And there's been lots of studies showing that that can enhance 
cognition, uh, different aspects of cognition depending on where the electrodes are placed. So the initial studies were all, I think, visual focused. If you passed it through people's like visual centers, they were able to attend more rapidly to like novel stimuli. And they've been repeating it with different areas of cognition. So memory, uh, language acquisition, motor learning, which is of special importance to people who want to use it for stroke rehabilitation. And yeah, the basic, the basic uh, neurobiological mechanisms are just being explored. We now know that it's kind of an increase or a change in polarization in neurons that predisposes neurons which are already active to fire. It makes them more likely to fire, but won't stimulate firing because of the current is so weak. So it seems to just enhance activity that's already going through those area, areas, possibly improving that activity, and then also leading to plasticity in that area, which is maybe how it has effects on learning, which is very exciting. So do you see kids in the future going to take a test with electrodes and a little battery in their pocket? <laughs> well, I, I can envision, like right now, you know, this is all possible and people are doing it. One of the beauties of the, of the transcranial thing is you can just get you know, a nine volt battery and rig your own electricity setup and kind of start doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite wired. So I can envision people that people are doing this, and, and this is being done in like you know research labs in Harvard and across the world, where you know if, uh, during the acquisition of a task, like acquisition of a new language or new instrument, you know applying electricity to the brain just to encourage plasticity in that really focused area that's involved in learning that skill, that could maybe increase the rate at which you acquire that that knowledge. Um, interestingly, there seems to be kind of a plateau effect. Uh, the stimulation doesn't help people who have already like mastered a certain type of learning, but people who are starting from baseline, people who are stimulated just get there quicker. Shortens that ramp. Yeah, so I can see it being used yeah, for studying sessions. If you want to give yourself some kind of techno boost while you're studying a certain type of knowledge, you know, it, it might work if there is some evidence showing that it would work. Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, another area, oh, sorry, I had something I could on there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it, it's also relevant to uh, the quantified self movement um, and meditation. Um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised I haven't bought this yet, but there are consumer grade brain computer interfaces now where you can get these like, you know, they're sort of like headsets that have either one or three or like nine um, sensors that, you know, you have to place in reasonably close contact with your, uh, your skull. And um, they get, you know, simplified, but nevertheless real uh, readings of, of uh, you know, variation in, in activity in different parts of the brain. And one of the neat apps uh, and that, that I've seen that is designed for use with these uh, interfaces is uh, a meditation feedback where it, it's like they made a meditation game where there's this like mandala that sort of grows and it's measuring both attention and relaxation at the same time, which is sort of the two things you're trying to do at the same time, which go in opposite directions during meditation, which is, I think, sort of a big part of why it works the way it does, is you're trying to both relax, but in the most energized way you possibly can. And uh, it measures those two metrics, and when you, know, you keep them both above a certain threshold point, um, you sort of get points, for lack of a better term, but the points are really just growth of the mandala, and then once it gets to a certain size, it collapses, and then you go on to like the next level. And so it's a way that you can like get better at meditating by getting some feedback um, based on gamifying. Yeah, yeah, gamifying meditation, which I think has like probably quite real applications yeah. for people. Well, I'm really interested in, in the converse of that, in finding the areas that are activated during meditation, and stimulating them right. to increase plasticity in those areas and maybe <coughs> increase the rate of progression down you know, some spiritual path even. Um, I think it's possible if, if you know, stimulation can help you learn your visual spatial skills, uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason why it wouldn't help you learn to develop your self-awareness mm -hmm. through meditation. Mm -hmm. And the combination of a device that can accurately measure the brain and one that could actually accurately like, stimulate certain areas of the brain would just be really powerful. Doesn't that just take us out of the equation? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no room for yeah. moral agency whatsoever anymore. It's like, I just the one, you know, it's just all yeah. controlled by matrix now. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. Good. Well, thank you on that topic. Um, another area I think is important when we're talking about life extension and the brain um, is 
so far we've, we've mentioned that uh, we, we basically can study how people have managed to stave off the effects of aging, um, slow that down, maintain function into their late 90s, that sort of thing. But um, at some point, it's going to become necessary to get actual rejuvenation of the brain. Um, most people in this room are probably familiar with the strategies for engineered negligible senescence, which is basically tries to break aging down into about seven problems and propose engineering solutions to reverse those. Um, I'm just curious about you guys' take on that. Um, any, anything you see as promising in the future, or in the near future even, is there anything in the next 20 years that's going to, to be a therapy that can, that can actually rejuvenate your brain and not just slow down? <coughs> yeah, well, if we could find a way to you know, either increase cell production of the brain in neurogenesis or prevent that, those declines in like, general brain volume that happen with age, that would be really key. And also, if we can figure out, there's thousands of people working on this, but figure out you know, the, what happens with myelin fibers, what happens with you know, the wrapping of neurons that allows uh, signals to transmit quickly down them, that kind of degrades as we get older, and that seems to have really profound effects on processing speed, and then you know, leads to uh, you know, all kinds of diseases. If we can figure out those problems, that would be good. The other one I've looked into is, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one of the SENS targets, they're mitosens. They want to stop kind of the degradation of mitochondria and the accumulation of mit like junk proteins in the mitochondria that cause it to throw off free radicals and just in generally be worse at running the cell. And there's some research that like neurons are kind of especially vulnerable to that type of damage and repairing Mitochondria has a, like a significant effect on neurons, especially. So certain supplements like acetyl L-carnitine, which is important for mitochondrial health, seems to really specifically help out neuro nerve cells and might actually be able to restore a little bit of cognitive function of people who are suffering from memory loss. Um, yeah, I'd love yeah. to hear your so the only the thing that I think will come up soon is probably a calorie restriction mimetic. So calorie restriction is one of the proven strategies of leasing variation of species up to non-human uh, primates to extend lifespan. So calorie restriction, like for example, you need 2,000 calories a day. So they feed rats, mice, dogs, um, horses, whatever, 50% of that caloric intake. And in rats, what happens, in rats and in mice, what happens is their lives get extended by 50%. Now, the reason that happens is kind of related to uh, cooling the body, you know, slowing down the metabolism. Because if you listen, if you read Aubrey's great ending aging, a lot of the reason why we age is because we accumulate these seven types of damages, right? Our metabolism runs, it's not perfect. It can't repair itself perfectly, so we accumulate damage. So the slower, it doesn't slow down your metabolism, but it changes the metabolism in such a way that it runs more efficiently, so it produces less damage. So that causes your lifespan to be extended because you accumulate less damage. Now, if you were to practice that in real life, it has its cons. You have emaciation, constantly cold, you basically can't eat a lot of foods because if you eat like a piece of pizza, you're already over your caloric limit, and you're always near your caloric limit for the day, and low libido, Menstruation sometimes. The menstruation so, stops. Which is, it's a mixed bag, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you lose your vital load. <laughs> yeah. You lose your mass, and like if you were to get sick or you were to get injured, it's very hard to recover from. So those are downsides. So what they're working on now is a calorie restriction mimetic, looking at all the metabolic pathways, where they can activate these pathways, but you don't get the downsides of it. Yeah. Right? So if we could have something like that, it could extend our lifespan. Like all of people lived up to 120 were probably on some form of calorie restriction. Like if you look at pictures of them, they're short, they're very thin, right? And they've been like that all of their life. So it could extend maybe the average lifespan from 80 to 90, or 80 to 95. And within that 15 years, like, Audrey de Grey's whole idea of the singularity, you know, within that 15 years, they can find something, right? Escape velocity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other one of the, the send strategies that I think is, <coughs> probably more likely to gain traction sooner than, than the others is lysosense. So Dan was talking about yeah. mitosense, which is basically about, there's the 13 mitochondrial proteins that never evolved their way to be 
uh, not just present in the mitochondria, but also inside the nucleus of the cells, where they're better protected from uh, damage by reactive oxygen species. And the idea of mitosense is about um, basically transplanting those 13 genes back into or, or into the nucleus where they're protected, and so then the mitochondria. Well, the mitochondria is like the furnace in the cell, so it's lots yeah. of burning going on in there. And, and so this would be sort of kind of in a way completing an evolutionary process that seems incomplete based on evidence that we've seen in other, not only animals, but also plants that have different subsets of mitochondrial uh, genes um, inside the nucleus versus just in the mitochondria. <coughs> Lysosense is um, a different strategy related to um, introducing into the human biology uh, novel enzymes that can break down waste products that our cells can't currently break down. So the most superficial evidence of those kinds of uh, garbage products is liver spots, where the body just says, I don't know what to do with this, so we'll put it all over here, in this, in this one spot, and we'll just ignore it. Um, but if we were able to use um, lysosomal enzyme therapies, where we basically supplement enzymes that we don't have, by going looking for them in places where we know they exist, i.e. in the earth where we know that human bodies are broken down completely, so we know that there must be bacteria and other microorganisms in there that can break down these particular products because you don't just end up with a bunch of litter spots. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if we could use those enzymes. I think that those are that's a really promising one, and I think since just last year they identified a, um, a, a damage well, it's hard to say whether or not it's a biomarker of some other underlying kind of damage or the source of damage itself, but it's called 7-keto cholesterol, and it's implicated in the pathogenesis of both arthrosclerosis and Alzheimer's. And if it is actually one of the forms of damage, it is one that, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these waste products that could potentially be broken down by lysosomal enzymes, but not ones that we have. Lysosomes are like the garbage cleaners inside our cells. Um, if they could find a novel lysosomal enzyme that would target 7 keto cholesterol, that, that would be a really intriguing direction for them to go. And, and others like it, I think that's something. Because there's already lysosomal enzyme, enzyme therapies for um, diseases that aren't diseases of aging. Yeah, um, yeah, it's called, go, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so that seems closer on the horizon than something else. What about stem cells? Um, you know, there's, there's some off-label treatments going on in like joints, you know, they'll inject, they'll actually take someone's stem cells out and clone them. And yeah, that's not exactly a regeneration. But but I'm wondering if you were able to do that with you know, neural precursor cells and put them into the brain. Um, it's, you know, those pathways that are already established, how would those be? Basically? Wasn't there a mouse study on that already? And they were able to reverse cognitive decline in mice yeah. with allogenetic stem cell therapy? Yeah, I yeah, I believe there was. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, it works for months. It's worth a try, probably. Yeah. 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 Oh, we've got a question. Oh, uh, just a funny comment. Uh, when you're mentioning lysosense, the uh, bacteria they found that best broke down a lot of this lysosomal garbage was found in a uh, trash dump behind a jack in the box. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story about the graveyard is so much more glamorous oh. in a weird, morbid way. But that's, cause that's, you know, that's the one that made it into the documentaries. It's like, oh, we could grave wandering through a graveyard oh, looking yeah. for, you know, bacteria <laughs> that can break down everything in the human body, but jack in the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. We are still in the great age of exploration. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> say jack-in-the-box and bacteria usually kills people, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. If you were around like 25 years ago, you'll remember what I'm talking about. Oh. Yeah. That's why we all got me up here. Yeah. So uh, another topic uh, would be if you are going to look into cryonics, um, is there any talk or any thoughts that have been about how to prepare your brain uh, maybe to better withstand something oh. like that? Uh, I, I've never heard of, you know, say a pre chronic supplement regimen. Oh, you know who has lots of those ideas is Doug Scracking, and I wish he could have come today. But yeah. I think creatine is actually the one, one of the ones he suggested. Um, and he, he often, uh, Doug is uh, part of CryoBC, um, and he doesn't have cryonics arrangements himself, but he's always he's always got something for show and tell. So, like, the number of like spices and things that I have in my house, because like, I've got like cumin or cumin, I've got cinnamon, like cinnamon sticks. Um, all sorts of things. He always brings something. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think creatine taurine was another one that he yeah. suggested as being sort of like a, if you feel a heart attack on the cars and you've got cryonics arranged, <laughs> I'm a whole bunch of taurine. <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder how practical those kinds of ideas are. But uh, if, if you were to just start supplementing with them on a regular basis anyways, I guess it comes down to dosage, right? Could you spend every day as if it was a doing a giant mega dose of creatine and taurine and all sorts of other antioxidants to stave off components of ischemic damage? Or would you be better off just taking these things on a daily basis for their <coughs> other life experience? Or is it going to make you a compulsive person with no mental health? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the research on creatine and muscles, you have to load it. It takes approximately three months for the levels to reach a stable baseline, right? Are you, are you, everything is in uh, homeostasis in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you push something and it's sort of like Le Chatelet principle in chemistry where you, you alter the equilibrium. Right. Um, when you're supplementing something like creatine, um, if you stop, are you going to be in a worse situation than if you hadn't suffered in the first place? No idea. No idea. I know it kind of goes back to one of the earlier topics, but I did want to know, um, because uh, Hans, you pointed out, uh, creatine and lesion were the two that you sort of picked out of yeah. the multitude as being, I guess you were looking mostly at neuroprotective, or were those, that wasn't, that wasn't your general supplement regime? No, it was no, just, just neuroprotective. Yeah. It's the only ones that I found out had pretty solid evidence that okay. the protects were because what I was wondering was, Dan, because I know you, you did a talk to the mm -hmm. Life Extension Club, I guess it was like a year and a half or two years ago, and uh, you were talking about nootropics, but you were kind of looking for ones that had neuroprotective aspects to them. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you might add to Hans's list as things that you've seen like reasonable evidence for as, as neuroprotective? Mm -hmm. Well, based off the, the mice research with acetyl-L-carnitine acetyl and alpha-lopoic acid, uh, the combination of this the fatty acid and strong antioxidant in alpha lipoic acid, and the uh, protein that's really important for mitochondrial health in Alcar, uh, that seemed to be protective and also remediate cognition in, in aged mice. And that's all I had. I know I was also talking a lot about lion's mane mushroom. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I know there's which is which is, uh, which is another interesting thing. There's a mushroom that's supposedly uh, able to increase neurotrophin levels in the brain, which might help neurons, you know stave off damage and possibly even induce the growth of, of new neurons. No, is but, it a pill or a, a dish? It's a, <laughs> it's a common thing, yeah. isn't it? In, yeah. in like actual yeah. Asian food, yeah. not our version. Yeah, it's, it's a mushroom that uh, would be nice to eat in a dish. It's really edible and it's supposed to be quite tasty. It tastes a lot like lobster, but it's very hard to find. And uh, there's much different sources online with um, various qualities. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. I know a couple of suppliers I would not recommend. And uh, I'm also not too uh, certain about the status of that supplement. There hasn't been much research since an initial 2008 study, which was very, very uh, optimistic. Let's, let's talk about the threats to your brain. You talked about um, the coming wave of potentially radioactive seafood. Yeah, I just want to touch on um, supplements first. You know, I've done a lot of research in that area, too, and what you have to be careful of is that a lot of supplements, a lot of benefits are claimed, but there's no hard research to support it. And one, the risk could be known, and two, the risk could be unknown. So like, when you take a supplement, you really have to balance the benefits and the risk. So like, for example, with Alcar. Um, Bruce Ains did most of the original studies on Alcar and R alpha lipoic acid. And if you look at, there's a lot of research studies coming out now with heart disease and something called TMAO, which is trimethylamine oxide, causing heart disease. So what they showed was in rats, they obliterated the, gut, the colon of the rats, the bacteria from the colon of the rats, and one group they didn't, and they fed them choline. And so choline is a precursor to this TMAO, which supposedly causes heart disease. Now Alcar in humans also raises TMAO. That's a possibility that, sure, you take Alcar for neuroprotection, but it can also cause vascular dementia. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to be that the, the gut flora were gut flora. metabolizing it. So what they found is like vegetarians who don't usually eat choline, so the choline is in the source for energy for these gut colons, their TMAO production is less. 
that's another possible beneficial uh, protection from heart disease and stuff from a vegetarian diet. So, so like, but then is alcar referred to, like I said, in the name that it's a carnutrient? So then is, yeah, it is a carnutrient. So it's something that is promoted to vegetarians is something that they should be supplementing, but yeah. you're suggesting that uh, might actually like I originally, I, not have. Yeah, I originally, my original presentation included and last year included Alcar as one of the part of nutrients, right. but then this new, st new data came out. Right. right? So maybe it is it's never been neutral. It, it, it's probably is a car nutrient, but the downsides are worse than it's. Right. So you always have to weigh the benefit in the risk. Would you would you include choline in that list of because I think you you're supposed yeah. to be getting a certain level. Yeah, supposed to be getting a certain level of choline. So so you don't just just don't go over unnecessary evil. Unnecessary. Right? <laughs> you need it. And then the other thing with alpha lipoic acid. I think it was with alpha lipoic acid they found crystallizations of it in the heart muscle. It's in <laughs> rats, So, yeah, it's just something. But it's so hard. That's the thing. Like, I mean, and that's, that's you know, why I asked the question because you'll get a different answer from every person you talk to about, you know, what should be in the list mm -hmm. and what shouldn't. And mm -hmm. it is so difficult, um, I think, for people. And that, I guess that's why I tend to, when, when people ask me personally about like, supplements, you know, Sometimes in my official capacity as an executive director vice president, I usually tell them the, the truth, which is that I don't supplement anything right mm -hmm. now because it seems like there's so much more to be gained by simply trying your best to stick to yeah. one of the evidence-based diets, like you know, going for Mediterranean diet or something, yeah, just or something as close to it as possible, mm -hmm. and that that's probably easier by a much better study at this right. point with far larger populations yeah. than figuring out the perfect supplement regime. Mm -hmm. But the lithium is one that I've been interested in for a long time because it's just such interesting data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I got another question back here. Uh, does anyone, uh, I'm just curious if anyone thinks that genome analysis, like personal genome analysis or single nuclear poly, like uh, SMP analysis, uh, will, do, do you believe like results coming from those kinds of analyses will provide, will have a high impact on people and their behavior when they're trying to supplement and get better medicine, or do you think that it's just not going to tell us anything we didn't already know? I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot to go. There's a lot to be discovered, uh, you know, both about the strength of the genetic technique and, you know, the strength of supplements before we could really say that it would help there very much. At least that's my opinion. But for drugs and for the types of drugs that doctors are going to give, be giving out, that's something that should like already be happening right now, which isn't, and which is a terrible tragedy because you know there's so much good data linking like single nucleotide polymorphisms with bad drug responses. Yeah. And uh, potentially fatal ones. Yeah. Or alternatively, because they, you know, for things like warfarin, which is a blood thinner, you have to start, my understanding is you have to start the titration at a significantly low dose that if the person is sensitive, mm -hmm. they won't die from a bleed out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you knew in advance that they were warfarin sensitive based on their <coughs> genomic profile, then you could start the ones that were <coughs> sensitive on, you know, on the dose that they should be started at, and people that are sensitive on their own. I'm just curious that that would be it, but just be really expensive. I mean, like, right now with HIV treatment, there's a drug at back of your that if someone has a certain HLA profile, that they could die from an uh, allergic reaction to it. So when we see <coughs> HIV patients and we want to give them this drug, I'm sure we get that genome, we get that genetic testing done. But for drugs like warfarin, for like Tylenol threes with codeine and other drugs, like it'd just be too expensive to figure out. You just give it to them and see what happens. Yeah. But, <laughs> that's, that's, but that's way cheaper. But wouldn't like would it be that expensive, or, yeah. or would it be that expensive if you had to do it like in a hospital in a uh, post hoc fashion it, instead of just having it done with all kids? It's mm -hmm. a matter of course. Is, is there a name yeah. for the biological equivalent of Moore's law that things are getting half as expensive every for for sequencing? Months? Yeah, totally. Well, because it's an information text. Yeah. Sometimes referred to as the law of accelerating returns. When I started university, a professor came and he was, uh, you know, he was talking to a group of genome scientists and he was like soliciting them to see if he could get his genome sequence for under like six thousand dollars, and that was in two thousand and ten. And now I hear it's under two thousand. I think like the current goal is a thousand. Just curious, by show of hands, uh, how many people here have, have had your own genetic information uh, analyzed, whether it be the, the limited one or the uh, 
Okay, so a few people. Well, 23 and me have warfare and uh, sensitivity. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And also, so like, from the FDA, right? Yeah, now no. you have to download <laughs> your can't give you medical yeah. advice and <laughs> yeah. manage through your own. I think that will blow over. Yeah. <laughs> They'll probably just move their company like somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and get their lab testing done somewhere else, too. So, a couple of months would be okay. <laughs> I mean, my perspective on, because um, if I hadn't done my talk on cryonics today, I probably would have done, uh, I, I have a, a personal genomics talk in my back pocket. And my, my thoughts on its value, even though it is still, I think, in its infancy, is that it can help you prioritize lifestyle changes, um, especially with the ones that there is more robust data for. So you know, and, and they do give you confidence ratings in terms of like how many studies there are, uh, you know, how large the samples were. You know, this is like a four-star confidence rating for this particular uh, risk factor versus the you know the, the graded like that, um, but. If you're able to confirm something that you might be able to suspect based on family history, but that you can't be certain that you've inherited necessarily, um, you know, something like ApoE4 being such like a major, major risk factor for Alzheimer's, if there are any lifestyle choices that you really should be making in order to stave off Alzheimer's, if you're ApoE4 positive, like quitting smoking even sooner than you would have otherwise, it can help you prioritize versus if you realize, oh, you know what, I haven't inherited my dad's side of the family's propensity for type 2 diabetes, so I don't have to worry so much about, uh, you know, red. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I think that's where the value lies, but it, it is still early on in the development of personal genomics, but that's, uh, I think that's because it, because it can be hard to do all the right things all at once, but then how do you choose? Well, of course you quit smoking first, but then, you know, what do you choose after that? Okay. Um, do we have any last questions here? Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, Hans, you spoke about in your in your talk about preventing brain damage by like avoiding high risk sports, but what about other things like um, I don't know, air pollution or other sort of lifestyle things, the sort of exercise you engage in, um, I don't know, other things that you can sort of do to like physically protect your your, your brain. Right? Oh, right. Air pollution. I have a friend. Who, there, there's no research on air pollution and dementia, but I have a friend that works at COPD. What he's found is that cyclists have a higher rate of lung damage because they're cycling, they're breathing heavy, and they're breathing out all the exhaust from the cars, right? So they're at higher risk for COPD. So, and the mechanism may be inflammation, and that may be related to the brain too. And in terms of what some people, I mean, like the WHO a while ago released a document saying cell phone radiation may cause you know, brain cancer. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what have we done? Right. So cell phone towers, uh, cell phone. Have you tried to buy a non-wireless mouse recently? I <laughs> don't think they make a video. <laughs> <laughs> and like, the research on that really is equivocal, but it's a possibility. So if you're afraid of it, protect yourself. So it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to make a cell phone that has a, a Geiger counter in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Other than that, just hold it by your Don't get a concussion or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this might seem a little strange question, but has there been any, um, any sort of data about uh, where you live uh, in terms of like climate or those kind of things uh, on longevity? I don't know of any, any like cross cultural things that blue zones blow. I, I right. think that there is a, a, a link with people who live in the extreme, uh, like north and I would assume extreme south, oh. where there's greater depression levels. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was searching around Micro Rise, uh, which is like a crowdfunded science platform, and one project is to try to determine if. Uh, Preliminary results, which suggest that people at higher altitudes experience lower rates of dementia, is uh, whether that effect is true or not. So that's one thing. That, uh, so higher altitudes, higher altitudes, lower dementia. The higher altitudes, like yeah. the people there, don't live very long. I heard they they live, uh, they escape dementia more regularly. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. It might have been in the north too. It might have been like a colder climate thing. But that's what the project was going to investigate. Now they have those tents that athletes use for hypoxic tents. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, it might be better to <coughs> sort of like cardiovascular health. So you're awesome. you're yeah. sleeping in the tent. It's, it's pulling oxygen out of the air at night. So you're in a it said it raises your altitude by 6,000 yeah. or 2,000 yeah. meters equivalent. Yeah. And then you come out in the morning and you breathe the normal air that's at your altitude and it increases your blood ability to carry oxygen. Yeah, that sort of thing. increases like blood cell function. I suppose you can get a little mental kick out of that as well. <laughs> um, hey. You guys have heard of the, the six approved US military uh, enhancement Tools. Basically, they've reviewed you know yeah. thousands of things that are supposed to improve your capabilities. Uh, there was six that they decided had validity. It was um, overall, but definitely uh, the doping the red cell, basically pulling out red cells and then putting them in at the time that you needed it. Are we clever? I just think that's such a collective. It's just one of those like holy shit. That's what you said. Yeah, exactly. That's what they're like. I'm coming back for you. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, I don't remember all of those. There was that, there was caffeine, there was modenafil, and a couple of other things. But So basically, there, there's, there's a lot of purported things out there and, and very few that are effective, but there are some. So. Mm -hmm. I know, what we have to be careful of, like, when you think about life extension, you think about anything um, health related is. There's a spectrum of things. So, like on one side, you have calorie restriction, which actually extends your lifespan. On the other side, you have things like people who use steroids to get huge, right? And on the calorie restriction side, there's no growth. On the steroid side, there's growth, and they're opposing. Right? So you really have to choose a balance of um, which side you want to be on. Yeah, until we find a way to hack the yeah. system. So, like, <laughs> like, with, like my my issue with lion's mane is like. Yeah, it could increase your traffic growth factor, but yeah. it could cause you can change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. Or, or epilepsy or something yeah. like that. That's the neuro kind of developmental. And with Afrinoff, it they keep you up forever, but uh, it's probably not good for you. Actually, it'll go crazy. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I kind of wanted to go back to uh, life, uh, calorie, caloric restriction mimetics. And because uh, the last thing I heard about resveratrol. Uh, was optimistic. Uh, the last thing I heard was that they, I think they finally linked it to serotonin gene activation. Mm -hmm. They finally got that link fairly uh, convincingly demonstrated. Mm -hmm. What's your What's your take on that? I I, I found that idea a long time ago. Me too. So I, 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 I didn't follow it. Maybe they found something, but like at the time when I abandoned it, there was a lot of fake data being created by the original mm -hmm. company that started on um, respiratory. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't. Yeah. No, it's not. Not something that you may have done. Especially at the height. I mean it wasn't a, it wasn't something you could get at a dietary level no, in effect. It was, no. it was pretty hard to yeah. inject it. All the grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember reading you're supposed to get like grape skins and then just kinda of, like slip them under your tongue. <laughs> in order to absorb the right amount. It's it really kinda of hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alright, well if uh, further questions, I'm sure you're on for questions, we're going to something after, so I'll let... Uh, well, yeah, so uh, it, originally we thought we would actually have more time between uh, this stage of the event and leaving for dinner over at Subi's. Um, uh, but we so still have this space till five. We've got this space till five, so the, what was sort of scheduled now is really just a sort of breakout period with some unstructured social uh, socializing and networking, and then in about 20 minutes or so, um, we'll, you know, we'll get ready to go and walk down to Suki's. Um, in the meanwhile, in the last, you know, sort of 15, 20 minutes or so, um, if anybody who came today, and it's been great to see so many new people uh, here today, so many like non-existing lifespan members, um, if any of you have been uh, didn't sign up for membership at the beginning and, and made a donation, if you've been persuaded as a result of this uh, event that you'd like to join, um, of course any donation you made at the beginning of the day will credit that towards the membership fee of $30, and you'll also get one of those really cool uh, one of these great uh, uh, common live long water bottles that's sort of modeled after this. And someday we're going to do a group buy order of the shirts because people have actually um, really an interest. But these, these would be $10. So if you uh, upgrade to an annual membership of Lifespan Society, you'll get this thrown in. It's really only like another $5. Before you 
Um, and uh, and we, we, we do a lot of events. Uh, our goal this year was to do 24 activities and events. Uh, we surpassed that, I think, by August. So uh, we, we had a trip down to Portland. We spent a couple of days there with some pretty interesting stuff that we rented a whole house for that. Uh, and actually, I think next year, this is brand new because I just got it in an email yesterday. Um, the people that were running the conference down there wanted to co-organize a conference with us, um, split the difference, do something in Seattle. Uh, um, so that would be cool. Yeah, so it would be a co-conference between Lifespan Society, BC, and the Institute for Evidence Based Cryonics. Um, but, uh, you know. And probably we're going to have Aubrey here, uh, probably for the next one of these. Aubrey. Aubrey de Grace, right. sorry, yeah. The, the, the Aubrey. <laughs> the Aubrey. We're on first name today. Aubrey de Grace. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so I guess that's it. For yeah, the, uh, um, we'll go ahead and like, sit for a break. Uh, we'll go down there a little bit. Anybody can stick around to have dinner with us. Uh, if you guys didn't get your email to Julie, uh, please do that. Um, even if you're not prepared to sign up at this time, we're happy to just kind of let you know if things are coming up. We, we use Facebook, Meetup, email. Uh, so yeah, Carrie is our social media coordinator as well. So the map to the restaurant, Subi's Cafe, is on the backs of your programs. Um, otherwise, we'll be going down there as a group um, shortly before our reservation. And uh, is there anything else that I forget? Uh, we just want a round of applause for all the volunteers. And, Yes. Yeah, well, that's right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie Socie, our administrator. She's worked so hard. She even brought her partner, long-term boyfriend, in who uh, you know helped us set things up. Um, thank you to my board, my wonderful board. Uh, three out of four are here today. That's fantastic. So, Leigh, thank you for um, doing the video. And anybody else I forgot? But yeah, right. our speaker. Our speaker. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.